Hey, hey, you're keeping company with Connor, and you're listening to another Town Square Spotlight. I'm really happy to be speaking with this individual today. Something that I didn't know, there was a recent rebrand. It was kind of crazy because we were going over this. The uh, Breakthrough T1D Community Walk is coming up, and it was like, oh, that's a organization I'm not familiar with. And in doing a little more research, and of course, Kelly telling me, it's the rebrand from the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. It's like, okay, see, I'm learning a little something here too. <laughs> and I love when I get to learn something that I have nothing, that I know nothing about because somebody out there in the community needs to know about this too, and we can learn and grow together. So I'm really happy to be speaking with Kelly Costello. She's going to be running the Breakthrough T1D Community Walk that's happening at the East Fishkill Recreation Center on November 3rd. That's going to be happening 12 to 4, and it's going to be a really fun event, and she's going to get into it more for us. I'm going to shut up now and introduce her. Kelly, how are you? Good. How are you? I'm really happy to have you in here, and congrats on being on the radio. I know you're saying this is one of your first experience. This is the first experience on the radio. (laughs) Yes. Yes. This happens more often than you think. I have a lot of people (laughs) who this is their first time, so Mm -hmm. it's an honor. I'm really happy to have you in here for this. And, of course, uh, before we get into, like, the nitty-gritty in the story and how it got here, can you tell us a little bit about... uh, the uh, Breakthrough T1D Community Walk. Why should somebody participate in this? Um, Well, I believe that somebody should participate in this because uh, the Hudson Valley happens to be a very rural area, and families are diagnosed oftentimes, not always, but when their children are young with type 1 diabetes. And um, I think that we're sort of isolated when kids are diagnosed early on. Um, And this uh, community walk provides an opportunity for us to sort of get together as a supportive unit and make connections with other people that have the illness in the area um, so that you're not feeling like you're sort of stuck in your own world suffering through the disease and trying to manage the disease. Uh, it's, It's really difficult for parents of children of all ages to um to adjust to it. And so I think that meeting other people and coming to the walk um, is really important. And and the fundraising aspect of it and and creating walk teams is what we're really looking for because that allows us to develop more funds to go towards research and the technology. Absolutely. I think that is so needed. And I'm glad that you said that about the Hudson Valley being like a rural area. It's true. There is a lot of farmland. When people say it's like, oh, I'm from New York, people think in the city is like, no, Hudson Valley is not that. And it's right. Things can be very spread out. So I'm glad that you guys are giving the opportunity for people around the Hudson Valley to, you know, help spread the awareness, get more money for this. And definitely on the awareness side, let's talk about type 1 diabetes there. I feel like a number of people, of course, know of diabetes, Mm -hmm. but unless you have it, there are so many misconceptions to it, and a lot of people really don't understand, and especially the different types. And right. I'll admit, I am definitely ignorant to some of it myself. Mm-hmm. So as a mother with a child who has type 1 diabetes, mm-hmm. could you explain to us, based on your you know, perspective, what exactly is type 1 diabetes? So, um, you know, we were the same as you. We didn't really know. And and when our son was first diagnosed, um, we actually left the hospital and it was like, okay, this is just going to be how it is. And then as we were home trying to deal with it, we realized it was much more complicated than we really knew of or found out in the hospital. Um, So type 1 diabetes in a nutshell, now I'm not a doctor, but this is my (laughs) understanding of it, is um, your pancreas basically dies in a way and your beta cells stop producing insulin. So the body can't survive without insulin and um, the you know there's no production of it anymore. So the only way for someone to survive is to inject the insulin um, into their bodies. For our son, it was like every two hours. He had to have the insulin in his body. He had to do an injection every two hours. Wow. Um, and then in addition to that, he needed to um, ha- have, a, have a pump, you know, so that, that he would always have it on him and he could inject for whatever he ate. So it was every every everybody, like I'm functioning right here, my body is producing insulin, um, and that insulin is used for energy. And so what happens is when you don't have insulin in your body, your body finds other ways to create energy. 
and um, you develop something called ketones. And I, I know you're probably aware of like the ketone diet. You hear mm. that people force themselves into ketosis to lose weight. But with a type 1 diabetic, what ends up happening is that they develop ketones and the ketones are trying to find a way. Your body's trying to survive. It's trying to adapt and find a way to develop the energy. So the ketones will first start eating away at your fat. So when my son was first diagnosed, he lost about 20 pounds. Oh, wow. And that's how the pediatrician figured out, like, oh, we should check his urine for sugar. And that's how we knew. Um some kids are first diagnosed by going into total ketosis, which is very dangerous um, and, 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 you know, life-threatening. So anyway, the, the ketones will start to eat away at your fat first, and then you will lose the fat, you will lose the weight. And then once that's gone, unfortunately, the ketones will start to eat away at your muscles. And your organs are muscles. So if it goes on for too long, your muscle, your organs can fail. Um, and it can be a very dangerous situation. So I think the difference, you know, between type one and type two is type one people, um, they, they need it to survive. They would not survive without that insulin. Whereas type two individuals, um, their body, they've, they've, they, their metabolism and the weight that they have gained, they're not, their cells are not absorbing the insulin that they have. Mm. Um, and, and they need medication to help them fix that. And they can go on diets to help them fix that. But they wouldn't necessarily not survive, you know, because they still have it in their body. Their body's still capable of producing it. So type 1s, they are incapable. And so every day for a type 1 is a day of trying to survive. Wow, that must be difficult. And especially in the case of your son and all of you and your family having to adjust to that. That must be difficult for just about anybody. And that's a total life shift, as you said, like, something every two hours mm-hmm. is that still the consistency um pretty much uh, he he has a pump now so that's that's helpful it'll give a little bit of insulin all day long in his body and then when he goes to eat a meal he'll have to take a, a certain amount of insulin based on the carbs that he has um, but there there are carb ratios everybody's insulin needs are different mm. um, and also different things can affect your need for insulin like high stress times of high stress you might need more puberty you know we went through an incident where he was taking 9 units of lantus which is a long acting insulin to you know, 2 weeks later going into the hospital again and they said he needs 23 units of lantus like it was a huge increase because of puberty and because of hormones yeah um when you get sick you need sometimes more insulin um it's it's very complicated and and i think it's also complicated too because everybody is so different yeah you know and their needs are different that's crazy and this might be an ignorant question though but (laughs) how does it work when it comes to sleeping does he have to get up every couple of hours too, or is that where the pump kicks in? How does that work? Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. So sleeping, actually, I didn't sleep for the first year of Oof. his diagnosis. Um, I was up all night because I was terrified. Um, they can they can go low at night, so a lot of diabetics will maybe have a, like a high protein snack before bed. Um, he doesn't have to inject the insulin when he's you know when he's sleeping. Um, but he does have we we have a thing on our phone that will alert us if he goes too low at night like i have it's called sugar mate if my phone rings it wakes me up and it says you have a glucose value that's below 70 and you need to oh, wow. you need to so i'll have to wake up and i'll have to give him a juice box to to pick the sugar back up so that's going to sleep is is scary for first time parents you know kids that are first diagnosed because the fear is if they go too low while they sleep they don't, you know, they might not wake themselves up. Some kids are very sensitive to it Mm -hmm. and they know when they're going low, but other kids don't necessarily feel it. And again, it's that, you know, everybody's different. Yeah. Um, So he doesn't typically need it when he's asleep. If he has the pump on, he has the Omnipod. So if he has that on, it's giving him the insulin throughout the night. So he's good. Um, But you know, other time. And he's a teenager, though, so sometimes that's difficult because he'll eat like a huge snack at, you know, three o'clock in the morning and I'll see that his numbers shoot up really high. And then, yeah, and then he needs to have insulin. But yeah, so there's just different tricky things during different times of the day. Yeah, no, I'm sure it, it total game changer the way that things have to go. But the fact that you have it on an app like this mm-hmm. to be able to help the way that 
technology has really advanced yeah. in these ways. Sometimes I'm always cursing at these computers and it's like, why won't you work? But something along those lines just goes to show you the blessings that we can get out of technology. I think that's terrific. So obviously you're running the Breakthrough T1D Community Walk, but how did you get involved with the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation and Breakthrough to begin with? I'm assuming it was probably shortly after the diagnosis then. You probably want to learn more, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was probably within... Um the year afterwards, I was looking for things, and we went on to, which was then the JDRF site, to find um, meetings. I really wanted a, like, mother's group because I, I didn't know how to handle this, and everything was online. Since the pandemic, the pandemic kind of flipped everything, you know, um, on its head, and everything was online, and I really, really wanted something in person. Um, and so I met some ladies in the area who had one. I was able to do that. Um, I met some people online to do the, the ones through JDRF. And then um, we must have been registered somehow. I know that JDRF gives like a bag of hope when kids are first diagnosed in the hospital. So your, your name is sort of put into their like database when you get this bag of hope in the hospital. And... Um, I was invited to the summit at the Culinary Institute. I received an email, so my family went to the summit, and there were two ladies that were there at the table, and they were promoting the, the really the first walk in our area last year um, since the pandemic uh, in Ulster County. So when I went there, um, I said to them, I said, I would love to get involved. Is there anything that you you know can do if you need any help? And they said, okay, sure. And then I got a phone call in June, and they were like, hey, can you run the walk? And I was like, <laughs> uh, sure, okay, I don't really know what I'm doing. But Be careful I, what you wish yeah, for. Yeah, yeah. So now I'm like elbow deep into the organization of it, and it's been truly a um, humbling experience because you're really asking the community to understand um, what people with type one are going through and to be willing yeah. to, you know, donate money or donate goods or sponsor or be a vendor for us. Um, and, and, and that was, that's kind of tricky sometimes. Oh, I'm sure as somebody who has to run events for here and outside of it, it's, it is difficult mm -hmm. and it is a lot to do, especially to just kind of throw on somebody who just a year before is like, yeah, if you just need anything <laughs> yeah. to totally outright right. running it. But you guys are really, I don't mean to sound uh, insulting by any means by this, but do are coming from a bit of a setback mm -hmm. because in recent years, the Hudson Valley chapter of the J JDRF did fall through, and that was because of pandemic reasons, right? Yeah, yeah. I believe they... Um you know, they just closed, they closed up shop, yeah, up in the Hudson Valley. And, um, I mean, we have, when we look at our l walk lists from the past, and the Hudson Valley is huge, right? Like, it encompasses a lot of different counties. We have on our list in, in past years, we have about 500, over 500 people that have, have walked That's with great. us. Those yeah. are great numbers. So, and, and I've actually, you know, as I talk to people, they're like, we didn't, we didn't know, you know, this was happening. We didn't know this was in the area anymore. And, and parents have been a little, you know, sad that it hasn't happened, you know, because of the pandemic. Um, but you know, the availability is out there. We want these people back, you know, yeah. these people that have walked with us from the past, um, like, please, you know, return to the walk. And, yeah. and and that's my goal, right? That's what I said to my son and to the ladies that organized it last year. Like, it was on the smaller end last year. Like, let's, you know, baby steps. Let's make yeah. it bigger this year. Let's bring more people back to it this year. Let's build more awareness in the area. Um, because there are people who are living with it, you know, right next to us every day. Absolutely. It's a blessing that this was able to be picked up again. And the ladies who did it last year, God bless them for being able to, you know, Absolutely. try to resurrect this. Yes. And now you're helping to continue that legacy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what exactly are you hoping to gain out of organizing this this year? Um, well, I think it's for me, it's twofold. And again, I don't work for Breakthrough T1D. I'm yes. just a mom. I'm just a volunteer. I, this was just landed in my lap. I think ultimately our main goal is fundraising. Our main goal is to get those funds that go toward um, the research and um, 
towards the technology, like you were saying before, you know, some I, my best friend is a type one. She's my age. She's in her mm. 40s. So when we were younger, we were kids, you know, she didn't have the CGM and she didn't have the insulin pumps. She would use like a, a dipstick to determine what her blood sugar was. Oh, wow. So the technology has come so, so far. And even the new like GLP ones like Ozempic and Mongero, there's research out there that those actually for a type one diabetic actually sometimes are able to regenerate the beta cells. So but it's oh, wow. very it's very early research. Mm-hmm. Um, but that research is what is funded by this company and by this group. So that's like of primary importance really is getting more funds from the Hudson Valley. We have the people, we have the energy. Um, Everywhere I look, you know, when I was looking for sponsors and vendors, like we really do a lot in this area, which is wonderful. You know, there are really a ton of people that are donating to these great causes. There are so many of them. Um, My second reason really for doing this um, in regard to fundraising is personally, I just want to have the best darn party for type one kids and, and adults. Um, for them. Like I want them to feel like they have a home, they have a community here. Um, they have people to make connections with, they have the support and I want us just to have an awesome day I think, together. I think it has great potential to be an awesome day. And I know your son has been putting in a lot of input <laughs> yeah, too. Yes. I know you said, um, before we got on the mic, uh, food was like yes. a big thing for yes. him. As a teenage boy, that's like his number one interest is getting food over there. It was like, all right, what food are we going to have? Right? So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that. I think that is great. Now, obviously, you said you want to bring a lot of people back who, you know, they've been a part of this in the past and didn't realize that, hey, things are back now. Mm-hmm. And I think also part of it, the name change, it can yes. be a little confusing to some people, too, because – I am familiar with the Juvenile Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, right. JDRF for short, but I didn't know that it changed to Breakthrough T1D community. So why was there the change in the first part? Um, so first I, place? I believe that they rebranded because I think that juvenile, that word juvenile diabetes, like it's sort mm. of a misnomer um, mm. because most type ones are diagnosed, not all of them. Some of them are, you know, have latent type one diabetes and are diagnosed when they're 40. Um, But most type one diabetics are diagnosed when they are juveniles. But um, so the attention going to the children, like, yes, that's absolutely important. It rocks their world. It's a total life change when they're little. It's actually very traumatic for kids, I I think, when they're little. But I think that misnomer of it being just juvenile, these, these individuals, they live with it for the rest of their lives. So there are adults who are, you know, have had type one for 30 and 40 years. So, and I think also breakthrough is, you know, breaking through with the research too, right? So I think that 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 name change is significant, you know, for our current times, just for authenticity, accuracy, um, you know, and addressing all levels of type one diabetics, not just the kids. Well, even as you said, you had a friend of yours yes. that has it. So I think that representation is definitely very big because, mm-hmm. sure, you might get um, get diagnosed when you're younger, but it's true. It's mm-hmm. lifelong. So, yeah. yeah, somebody who is 30s, 40s, 50s plus is like they might wonder for themselves, like, wait, where do I go then? Right, right. So I, I love the idea of the change. Now we just got to make sure that people are aware of it right? so that we can get people out. And I think events like this are going to be able to do it. Now, of course, that we still got a couple of weeks till the event, and people can still get involved. Yes, so absolutely. People can still get involved. You're they still can looking actually for vendors. Re- yeah, they can and, actually register that day. That's when so they cool. get there, yeah. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> it's like that really uh, helps uh, open it up for some people. But of course, yeah. So what are some p- things that you are still accepting right now? Are you still looking for vendors, still looking for food? What are you still looking for? Yes. So we, um, we're we looking for sponsors and vendors and donors, all mm-hmm. three. So we have sponsorship levels. Um and a certain amounts for those levels. And again, I don't have any control over that. That's really what Breakthrough T1D sets up for us. 
Um, so any company, I have reached out to several companies all, all summer, um, and we do have some wonderful sponsors already. We're being sponsored by New Vance Health. We're being sponsored by uh, Mid-Hudson Valley Federal Credit Union. Uh, we have a sponsorship. We have a donation from Williams Lumber. So we've had these great companies come in and um, offer their sponsorships for us. And we really couldn't run without the sponsorships. So we're looking for more businesses in the community to sponsor us. Um, vendors, we have a few vendors, but we are always looking for more vendors who, and it could be a variety of vendors, so they don't have to be um, type one related, so to speak. Yeah. You know, um, cell phones, like the, the, the apps that are on the cell phones that run the pumps. The pump is run on a cell phone. The CGM is run on a cell phone. You could be a cell phone company um, to show to show children or show families, you know, what phones are the best to use that align with the um, the technology that they have. Um, it could be someone who wants to sell T-shirts for type ones. Like we're really looking for any vendors, again, to make it for, I think for me personally, I'm like, make it like a party to make it yeah. fun. We want kids to, like whenever I go somewhere, I'm like, I want to buy something. Um, so I really think that that would be a good a good opportunity to get some vendors to, to come and do that. And then donors, um, any sort of donation. So like right now, we have a giveaway. We're not allowed to do um, like a financial raffle. We can't collect money from the walkers. Like the theory is they should be able to come there and just have a day that's for them. So mm. that's why we have everything donated. So gotcha. we need donations of um, like toys for kids where kids mm. can put in raffle tickets and they might win it at the end of the walk. Uh, maybe t tablets, uh, maybe uh, Apple watches, you know, like anything cool that a kid might need or want to use, um, you know, uh, diabetes bags or small um lunch bags, cooler bags to keep the insulin cold in. Um, so any sort of giveaway or donation um, would be so greatly appreciated. And right now we're looking for somebody who would be willing to donate food for um, the morning. So like when you first get there in registration, we like to have a little spread of like yeah. breakfast, bagels, pastries, coffee, um, uh, fruit. And we have to be careful because, you know, we can't have a lot of sugar right yeah, naturally <laughs> so like a, a good balance of sugar and protein would be would be really good cheese sticks yogurts oh, there you things go. like that absolutely yeah. no that's fantastic so for anybody who's listening to this right now and they either want to donate money or they want to donate some kind of good or want to be a vendor how should they reach out to connect um, so they can reach out to me. They can email me. Um, do you do you want me to give me yeah, my, you can give yeah, your email my email? You, yeah, go right it's ahead. Um, kcostello469 at gmail.com. That's my email. You can contact me directly for the vendor and sponsorships and, and donations. Terrific. And, of course, for those listening, I'll have that in the uh, description of this episode, of course, that you can find the links. You can find the email so you don't have to go hunting all too far. We like to wrap it up into a bow and make sure everything's all together for people. But no, I think that's fantastic. And I think this is a great way for people to get into this, understand a little bit more about it and reintroduce this to the community. Mm -hmm. As we said, this is coming back after the pandemic. And, you know, some people forget is like there's a lot of things still being rebuilt yeah. from the pandemic. Yeah. It wasn't that long ago yeah, yeah. that we were still shut in. So I think it's great that you've been able to take this on. I think it's great that this is coming back around. I think it's going to be such a fun event based on everything that you're saying. As we wrap up everything, do you have any last little nugget you want to share with the Hudson Valley listening audience, whether about the event, whether about diabetes or whether like just the family aspect of it all? Um, oh gosh, put me on the spot here. I wasn't ready for that one. Um, I think that, you know, I, my goal, I know that there's a, a young mother who reached out to me at the summit and she said, I really want to have a support group. So I think mm -hmm. that there are people who knew very newly diagnosed people who um, who are looking for support. And, and I want to tell people that that will be there. Yeah. Um, and we're going to create a special table for people to come and write down their names and get that support. I do want to say, though, too, one of the things that I noticed is people who have had diabetes their whole life, you know, I, I, sometimes I think those people are like reluctant, like, oh, I've been dealing with this my whole life. I don't really need to come to a walk or, oh, oh my daughter's going away to college. You know, we used to do the walks when she was younger. 
Um, and I just want to say, like, we need those people. We need the people who have, who are at an older stage of their life with the illness to be the sort of the representatives for the younger people who are just starting to go through it. So yeah. I think that those two worlds should unite at this walk. And I'm hoping that we can make some great connections that day. Introduce the veterans to it all. Yeah. And then, of course, build the community yes. and have the community accessible to everybody. I think that is so, yes. so big. Yep. Kelly, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate your time. I'm looking forward to your event and wishing you all the best with it. Of course, all the links and information will be in the description of this episode so you can learn more. You can reach out to register and donate and whatever your heart's desire with it. But it's going to be another great fall festival. And uh, as Kelly said, let's make it a party, right? <laughs> yep. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Of course.